All right, so today we're going to just hit, the, we're going to kind of just walk through these chapters as Stein does it. We don't have time to do everything he's doing, but we're going to hit some of the highlights and talk through the, what he's up to and why and the kinds of the point he's making. So we pick it up with, birth, with chapter 4, um, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, how it all started. What stands out to you in this chapter? Something should have, I'm guessing, but what is it? Anything? What stands out to you? I guess I was just interested with, again, the, the from below Christology. Uh -huh. Especially, I think, on page 66, he talks about um, too often we try and interpret Isaiah 7.14 as referring to a virgin birth. Yes. So, therefore, we make up this idea that, okay, Jesus was born of a virgin. Instead, uh -huh. that's not how it was seen until the virgin birth. Uh -huh. And then people look back and said, oh, this may, this is probably referring to that. Uh -huh. This is actually a huge issue and a huge point I, we need to get here. You need to understand the, the significance of what he's doing here. And so this is a great case study because he's going to use this same basic kind of argumentation many times throughout the rest of the book. So I want to make sure we get this right and kind of see what he's doing here and get this, okay? So what is Stein saying then? You're on the, exactly on the right track. He refers to the classic verse, Isaiah 7.14, which is? The virgin will be with child and shall bear a son. All right. You, some of you memorized it when you were eight years old for the children's Christmas program. All right. Behold, a virgin will conceive and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. And before he is you know, weaned, eating curds and honey, um, the threat will have departed. And the threat at that time was Assyria. Okay. You guys passed your ELCE, right, on Old Testament? That was a long time ago. Forgot that. So the threat will be gone. The threat then was Assyria. And so we have this wonderful text from Isaiah 714. And we have the, all the issues all flow around the question about this Hebrew word, Alma. Right? And in fact, this has been one of the litmus tests of a good Bible translation. So you pick up a new Bible translation, what do you do? Flip to Isaiah 7.14, how they translate it. And you look. And if it's a good translation, it's going to say virgin. And if it's a wimpy liberal one, it's going to say young woman or maiden. And this becomes a big criteria. Now, Stein hits this from a completely different angle. And he says, hey, Alma probably means young girl who's not yet married, virgin but kind of generic. And so a girl who's not yet had a child, but who conceives and has a child, would be an Alma who bears a child. So Stein argues this way. He says, Isaiah 7.14, if it was being read by the average Jew living in 0 AD, what would he conclude about the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14? When did it happen? Had it happened, or was it a messianic prophecy? It had already happened. It had already happened in Hezekiah. And so what Stein is arguing, you just look at the history of Israel, and we know that Isaiah is prophesying at a time when Assyria is breathing down the necks of Judea, and then there's this prophecy, hey, the virgin will conceive and bear a child, and it's going to be all right, and then this child is Hezekiah, and Assyria goes away, and it's all good. And so the average Jew would say, you know Isaiah, man, he nailed that one, and Hezekiah fulfilled it. That's cool. They weren't sitting around saying to themselves, Isaiah 7, 14, that's messianic. Someday the Christ will come and watch for any virgins getting pregnant because that's probably going to be the Christ. No one was thinking this. In other words, when you had your list of requirements for the Messiah, what was on the list? Davidic, no doubt about it. Had to be of the line of David and would be a king, would be great. So you had your criteria, but was virgin born one of, one of the criteria? No. No. Never entered into the mind of anyone. And this is the heart of Stein's argument. Stein is not trying to say, well, the liberals are right. It really wasn't a virgin. There's no virgin birth. That's not what he's saying at all. It's the opposite. You see, what Stein's argument is this. Stein is saying that the story of the virgin birth did not come about because we were trying to parallel pagan myths or trying to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. 
In fact, the story of the virgin birth came about for really only one good explanation. That's what happened. That's the one explanation. And in fact, the reality is Isaiah 7 14 was never seen as messianic until Matthew decided it was. And so Matthew said, you know, the virgin birth, that's a great part of the story. And then Matthew was reading one day through Isaiah, maybe by the direction of the Holy Spirit. We'll let him play into here as well. And he's cranking through Isaiah 7, and he reads, and the virgin, the Alma, will conceive and bear a son, and the lights go off. And he says, oh, man, that's exactly what happened with Jesus and Mary and Nazareth. That's what's going on. That's what was happening all along. And now we go back and read Matthew, and we think that was always the first meaning, but actually that was the second, second added on level. And what you really have then going on here with Isaiah 7 14 is not what we call strict rectilinear prophecy, but really a typology in action. You should have covered this somewhere along your Old Testament classes, or your exegetical stuff, because what you have then is a dual level of fulfillment. So is it fulfilled in Hezekiah? Yep. Are we done? Well, it turns out, no. There's going to be another layer of fulfillment when Christ comes and the real Alma gives birth to the one who is really going to redeem Israel, and that's the Messiah himself. And so that's the idea of the typology, a fulfillment and then a greater fulfillment that far exceeds the first. That's what's going on here. So it's not like, well, you see, Hezekiah, that's wrong. Fine. But the real insight of Stein is to say, we need to recognize that the driving force was the reality of the fact that the virgin birth is how it happened. And then Isaiah was added kind of later looking at it. And Stein points out the very fact is Matthew does this often. Matthew frequently takes an Old Testament prophecy and then attributes it to Christ being fulfilling it. And our reaction is often, hmm, I don't know if it really says that. Like he'll be called a Nazarene. But if you, you know, we, and that means he's from Nazareth. But if you look at the original Hebrew, it's really talking about being a Nazarite or something. And it's like, hmm. That's a little weird, but Matthew says, it's all good. Trust me on this. We think, okay, fine. You know, we'll run with you on this. <laughs> but um, if we made the kind of exegetical moves that Matthew makes, try pulling one of his moves in your exegetical class and see how that goes over. <laughs> you won't get away with it. But he can do it. Holy Spirit's involved here, and it's all good. But that's the point. He's making moves that would be kind of odd, and he's making them because that's what happened. And then he sees the Old Testament in the light of it instead of vice versa. He's not creating stories to fulfill prophecy. In fact, he's finding prophecy that corresponds with the reality that happens. That's Stein's point. Okay, you get this? Kind of a, it's a significant piece of argumentation. And it's kind of really cool. Because then you say, so where did the idea of the virgin birth come from? Well, it came from one fact. That's what happened. And that's the best explanation for why that story is there. Now, the other thing that's quite intriguing about Stein's argument, and he gets into a little systematics here, is he asked the question, was it necessary for Christology for Jesus to be virgin born? And what is Stein's answer? No. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I really liked his argument when you said that, in light of all we just talked about, but uh, we said the essence of the Christmas story is the incarnation, not the virgin conception. Exactly. Exactly. The essence of the Christmas story is not a virgin had, gave birth. The essence is the incarnation. And the truth of the matter is, now we're into speculation, and we should never go very far here, but just as helps to make the point, that had God wanted the Messiah to be a normal child, born of human father and human mother, and yet have him become the Messiah and fully incarnate Son of God, could he have done that? Yes. Yes. That he's God and he can play it out the way he wants. And so it's not necessary that, well, it had to be this way. In fact, God simply chose to do it the way he did it, and the virgin birth was kind of like a little extra feature coming into it, but not necessary. And, if you, and you cannot play the game, and Stein's very exactly right on this, you can't play the game of, oh, yeah, but he's got to be pure. That's why he couldn't have a human father. Well, now you're running into problems here because now you're starting to imply that somehow the humanity is impure, and we're going to deal with this much more thoroughly later, but there's nothing impure about the human nature. That's not the problem. That's not where the sin lies. And then you have the issue of, well, the virgin is necessary because you can't have sex involved, as if sex is somehow immediately, you know, inherently sinful. And that's not right. And that's not right either. And so this is not the issue. In fact, this is also, though, the reason why Rome came up with their doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, and, which is a fascinating doctrine because it actually made the books, I think, somewhere in like 1870s or 40s, 19th century. 
is when that finally came down as official Catholic doctrine, the Immaculate Conception, which of course, as most of you know, has nothing to do with Jesus. It's Mary's Immaculate Conception. Because if you're going to have Jesus be sinless, well, I guess his mom has to be sinless. We'll make her sinless too. Now, now the problem you have here is the dominoes. How far back do you go? You know, what about Anna? And what about, you know, everybody else down the line? You know, oh, well, well anyway, we'll, start with, we'll just go with Mary for now. But you don't need that. Mary is just a, just a lady. Very special one, no doubt, but a human. And yet, because of God's intervention, the child that is born is sinless. It's not because Mary is sinless that makes the child sinless. Indeed. All right, the one other thing that's kind of interesting in this chapter is when he talks a little bit about this whole idea of the doctrine of the virgin birth. And the word in Greek for virgin is parthenos, or parthenos, okay, the virgin. And how in some of the tabloid literature that was going around, the Jewish, you know, lit rhetoric, no, 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 it wasn't a parthenos that was responsible, it was a panthera. And in other words, a guy named Panthera or Panthera or Panthera, who was a Roman soldier who impregnated Mary, which was the myth they started floating around. And Stein points out they actually just have a kind of a play on words here a little bit. It's changed a couple of vowel uh, consonants around, and there it all works. And it's kind of interesting how you can see how the rhetoric would grow up around this. All right, anything else on chapter four? Yeah, yeah, sir. I would say that has nothing to do with it. The, and that's, what I was, you know, that's kind of the whole point with the Immaculate Conception. It's, the original sin does not come because he didn't have a father. I mean, the mother would have, I mean, Mary's got sin too. And so the, there's no, that doesn't take care of it. The point is it's the conceived by the Holy Spirit and there's something special about his conception. And that's what makes it unique. So he's fully human with human DNA and human genes, but not human sin. So he's unique that way, and it's because of the conception. But it's not because he's lacking a father. And that's kind of the whole point of, could there have been actually a normal human conception and still have become the incarnate Son of God? Sure, sure, God could have done that. So it's not because, well, the virgin birth is required to be able to have a, you know, a sonless son. No, it's not required. Okay, that's exactly the point. Good. Yep. When he says that Jesus Christ, and Jesus is a historical uh, Jesus, and Christ uh, is a proclaimed Jesus, the Christ. Mm-hmm. But I think this time is uh, too much focus on the, just the Christ. So yeah, there, he's, he doesn't want to play this game of the, this we distinction. Should, we should choose the balance, you know, the historical uh, Christ or proclaimed Christ. But in my opinion, at the stage, uh, a little focus on just Christ. And he's a uh, little bit ignorant kind of, of Jesus. Well, I don't think so. Stein's going to talk quite a bit about the historical Jesus, as much as we know about him. And Stein's point is, I think, that we don't want to distinguish the Christ of faith from the Christ of history. They're the same. That's going to be Stein's conclusion. They're the same. And that's where I would come down as well. Um, Jesus certainly focuses more on the human, human, human reality, and Christ you know, thinks about maybe the, the messianic role, the, the, the divine. But and ultimately, it's one person, one Christ, one Jesus Christ, and the Christ of history and the Christ of faith are going to be identical. That's going to be where we come down. Okay? Now, whether or not Stein does that, we can, we can debate about how effectively he does that or not, but I think he's, he does it all right. Better in the early chapters than in the later ones, I think. But one last thing on chapter 4 before we leave that completely. Um, he notes very honestly when there, are, when there are tough things in the texts, right? And he talks about the whole Quirinius problem, right, at length. And his bottom line is, we'll have to wait and see. And that was in the earlier chapters. And then in this chapter, what's the big issue he talks about, which is kind of a sticky problem? Is it the census? The census is an issue. Exactly what was the census of the whole world? How do we understand that? But he offers some answers. And then he also deals with another sticky one, that the genealogies. Go ahead. What are you going to offer? Well, I wasn't planning to say the genealogy or the killing of children. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, the, kill, the slaughter of the innocents is, is um, obviously a sad part of the story. You know, you have the whole um, December 28th, um, you know, remembering the slaughter of the innocents. <coughs> But as Stein points out, there's no record of this sec- in the secular literature. So people say, oh, that couldn't have happened. But what's his answer to that? Um, okay, Herod would have done, would have done this stuff all the time. It was right down his line. And Bethlehem is not a big place. So you're not talking about thousands of babies. 
yeah. maybe maybe 20. Wouldn't have heard been to some degree in charge of what was written down as history too? Yeah, more or less. He can't control all the history, but the bigger point is probably simply that it wasn't that many kids and it wasn't that unusual for that many kids to get killed, maybe. You know, these things happen. Yeah, and so if it's only 20 kids, well, oh well, Herod does this kind of stuff. And that's kind of the attitude. He was that what kind of guy. Um, on the genealogies, it's a little tougher. Now, what Stein does, and this is going to be another one of his standard moves all throughout the book, and we need to make sure we kind of get this. This is another kind of important argumentative point, or just the point to understand his, his progression of the, the arguments he makes. He says, there are possible answers for why it is that Matthew and Luke seem to disagree. One possibility is maybe Luke is actually tracing Mary's genealogy and not Joseph's genealogy. And that would take care of it. Another possibility is maybe there were these like double fathers, you know, a stepfather, father kind of situation, and one of them followed one line, and the other followed the other line. Maybe that takes care of it. Now, which one does Stein finally come down and say, this is the right answer? He doesn't. He doesn't need to. Now, this is a key argument you need to get. When we're faced with an apparent contradiction in Scripture, Stein's attitude is this. If there's an apparent contradiction, they seem to not be disagreeing with each other, I only have to show you why it is possible that they could both be right. I don't have to give you the exact right answer. I might not be able to figure it out. Maybe I'm not going to be able to tell you this is why, this is how it, this is how it happened. Maybe we won't know what the real answer is. But if I can offer even one plausible explanation that accounts for both being true, I'm done. Because now the person who says that couldn't have happened, I can say, well, actually, it could have happened and they don't have to be in disagreement at all. Now, whether or not this is what happened, I don't know. But it could have happened this way, so the fact is they can still both be correct, and we have no problem here with a contradiction where one of them has to be right, one of them has to be wrong. That's not the case at all. And this is going to be a move he's going to make frequently through here. It's not unlike what happens in a court of law in the United States when you've got a criminal case going on. You've got the innocent until proven guilty. So what does the defense have to do to get their guy off? All they have to do is create reasonable doubt. So they can say, maybe it happened this way, or maybe it happened this way, or maybe it happened this way. They don't have to come to the court and say, it happened this way, and that's why you have to let our guy off. Now, if they can do that, that's slick. But they don't have to. Only Perry Mason does that, but you guys don't know about him anymore. <laughs> but you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is say, maybe this way, maybe this way, maybe this way, and they say, oh, that's true. So we can't be sure it was this way the way the, the state's saying. The state has a much higher burden of proof. The state has to say, it was this guy, we know it, and that's why you've got to convict. And so what Stein is doing, he's taking the position of the defense. All we have to do is offer a possibility. We don't have to be, know which one. If we have a possibility, that's good enough. And this is going to be something I think you're going to even want to have carry over even into your ministry, because when you start teaching stuff about Scripture, you don't always have a clean-cut answer to things. But you can be able to say, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, any one of them will work, and we're fine. And we can be content with that. And then we move forward. Okay? All good here? And, yeah? This is a smaller point, but on 73, he says, uh, because Joseph was a righteous person, he sought to divorce her when he became aware of her. Yeah. Pregnancy. Yeah. I was at marriage conference one time when the uh, Lutheran pastor said, um, we should use Joseph in ex as an example of love because he divor divorced her quietly. That way she wouldn't be publicly ridiculed. She'd have a chance to get married again later on. Obviously, that's not at all. No. Being said here. Now, I've heard actually the, the other argument that he says here after that, that the quietly part is what made him right. Righteous. Being righteous. He, was, he was being nice about it. Yeah, you know, and that was the, the, the righteous part. He wasn't, gonna, he, he wasn't going to cause her humiliation. He wasn't going to make her a scandal. But because he was righteous. Yeah, Stein's point is that the righteousness was actually divorcing her in the first exactly. place. Exactly. And I think Stein's in the right course on this one. The very fact that Joseph said, no, wait a minute, I'm a righteous Jewish man. I don't marry an adulteress. I can't. And so she's an adulteress, obviously, so I guess I can't marry her. Too bad for Mary. I, I can't do it. And so then he's going to be nice about it and be quiet, though. And that's, I think that's exactly right. That's where the righteousness comes in. And that's why it's necessary for the angel to come and say, hey, it's okay. The righteous action at this point is for you to go ahead and marry her. And he says, all right, I'll do that because I am a righteous man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. That's a very good point. And that's actually very important for all your um, Christmas and Advent preaching that's coming up. So um, don't screw it up. <laughs> all right. Anything else on four? Mm -hmm. Real quick, along the same line of changing the way you look at Christmas preaching. Yes. Was the point he brought up about the shepherds? How yeah. They just yeah. these blue class, good old. Yeah, yeah, good old boys. And he says, no, they weren't. They were actually scoundrels, and they were considered kind of 
undesirable. And for lots of reasons. They hung out with dead animals. They, you know, worked on the Sabbath. They didn't keep kosher the way they should. So they, they just didn't do the things they were supposed to. And so they were not good men. And you're right. We, we tend to idealize all these things, you know, all those good shepherds. Be like a shepherd. Oh, no thanks. You know. What's funny about it is that is their heritage comes from shepherds. Abraham and... and oh, yeah. One, yeah, nomad, nomads. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Chapter 5. What was the boy Jesus really like, the silent years? And this is a fair name, the silent years. We only have one passing reference from Luke about when Jesus was 12 years old, and the rest of this is silent, except for the apocryphal Gospels and these um, um, kind of false Gospels that came along, the pseudepigrapha. And other than that, we have nothing here. Now, what do you think about this chapter? What is Stein's argument about what Jesus was like? He was, he was just like a boy. Just a normal kid. And, and he cites cites um, in part uh, the first miracle, saying that this is his first miracle. Right. That this is his first miracle. And he didn't do anything else standing That's before right. that. And there's scriptural warrant for that. There's actually another really good scriptural argument for the normalcy of Jesus' childhood and young adult life. And that's the fact that when he does come to Nazareth and he preaches in their synagogue and he says, today, this prophecy, this great Isaiah prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. What do the people say? They say, we knew it! We knew it! That Jesus, he was always kind of a little different, man. Yeah, he was special. We knew it. Yeah, we knew it, Jesus. No, what's their reaction? No chance. We know, wait a minute. We know who this guy is. This is Jesus. He's the carpenter. He's the carpenter's son. And we know his sisters and his brothers. In fact, he's got four brothers. We know them. No way. Messiah, come on. No, 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 no. And why would they think that? It was because they had known him for 30-some years. And he was the guy, son of Joseph, worked in the carpenter shop, and he did his thing. And that's it. So when he turns around and claims to, make, to be Messiah, they're not buying it. And I think, to me, that's probably one of the most compelling answers to, uh, in support of Stein, that, yeah, it was normal. He was not weird. He was not, like, standing out. Now, the one thing that is a little bit hard to believe is when he says, what about Mary and Joseph? Wouldn't they have known that they had a sinless child? And Stein says, well, you know, nobody spent 24-7 with Jesus, so they wouldn't really be able to put it all together and compare notes. Look, he never sins. But um, you've got to admit that if you've got a kid who's never messing up, you're probably going to notice, I think. Besides, wouldn't it be great? You walk into a room, you hear a crash, you go running in. All right, who did it? Jesus, who did it? You know you can get a straight answer. You know? Well, sorry, Joseph. Jesus told you know, you're you're cooked. You know? <laughs> That's it. There's no there's no more weaseling out of this. But we don't have these kinds of indications. And in fact, Stein, you know, he speculates a little bit. You know, maybe just as the time went by, the, the memories faded. These things will happen to us. And remember, there are no video recordings, there's no pictures, there's no photographs of any of these events. So as time goes by, maybe Mary and Joseph even begin to wonder, you know, man, did that stuff all really happen the way we remember it? You know, I don't know. Or maybe just in the busyness of life, they just don't think about that stuff much anymore. So that when the time comes when Jesus is 12 years old and they have to go looking for him in the temple, they're surprised when he says things like, hey, wouldn't you know I'd be in my father's house? It's like, whoa. And they, they kind of are surprised by this. And yet, we're told that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And Luke benefits from this because he gets the first-hand scoop from Mary later on. So, it's interesting, the whole idea of um, what's, what Jesus knew or what the people knew about Jesus they didn't know. Now, what about Jesus' self-understanding? This is purely speculation. We just don't know. But <clears throat> I don't buy the idea that Jesus somehow gradually figured out that he was God. And you, you'll get this sometimes, you know, like in some of the old Jesus movies, like I remember in Jesus of Nazareth, my personal favorite Jesus movie, like 30 hours worth. That's, if it's a miniseries from back in the 70s. Some of you have seen parts of it. It's pretty well done, I think, because there was a good pious Roman Catholic was, that was the director, Franco Zeffirelli. Anyway, he has scenes like where you got the blue-eyed little Jesus climbing up a ladder and looking up into the clouds and, and kind of having this spiritual experience of communing with God, you know, and you get these kinds of things. But probably, more likely, the reality is he's fully God and fully man from the very beginning. And I guess I would argue that the fully man part is always at work, and the fully man part knows his full identity to the extent that he can handle it at the time. 
basically. So in other words, kind of comes along, and he always knows. So at 12 years old, does he know who his father is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, he knows. And so that, that's pretty clear cut, I think. Now, the other thing that's the big issue in this, this chapter is the whole question of the semper virginitas. which is Latin for always virgin, perpetual virginity. And the separate virginitas is part and parcel of Roman Catholic piety and theology, part of their Marian piety, that Mary was a perpetual virgin, always virgin, which makes Joseph saint indeed. He didn't know what he was getting into. That's supposed to be a joke. Man. So, the thing is, Luther himself also believed in this. And Pieper actually says, well, the separate virginitas is not a necessary doctrine, and if you don't believe it, I suppose you can still be orthodox, which is nice of Pieper to give us that break. Um, I need that. <laughs> the argument has been then that Mary was a perpetual virgin, and therefore, when Mark talks about the brothers and sisters of Jesus, that really means cousins. And this is Jerome's move. Now, what we have to realize is there's only one real motivation for preserving the perpetual virginity of Mary, and it has nothing to do with Christology. It just simply has to do with our, our veneration of Mary, and that's it. Um, why did Luther keep it? He was a good Roman Catholic. He had no problem with it, so he just held, held on to it. No surprise. But the fact is, if you just look at the text and think about the, what's really going on and what they say and what would have been the normal thing, would it have been normal for Joseph and Mary to have kids after Jesus was born? The answer is yes. Now, is it possible that they were um, stepchildren of Mary that Joseph brought into the marriage? Maybe. And that could take care of it. But again, the most natural way to read the text and the most natural way to understand it would be that Jesus was the firstborn and there were other kids after that. And even the Stein points out, you know, even it says in like, Matthew that he did not have relations with her until the Christ was born. And so, which would indicate that afterwards things were normal in a normal marriage and there would be other children. So, that mean, gives us Jesus having brothers, which actually fits also because we know that James, leader in the church in Jerusalem, is the brother of our Lord, was one of these four brothers. And, we, and Stein also points out we have at least four brothers and two sisters because Mark says his four brothers names them off and sisters, which means at least two. And so we have a fair-sized Jewish family and Jesus was the firstborn in there. All right, any other discussion there on the Semper Virginitas? The other thing is on the languages of Mary, uh, I mean of Jesus. And this is kind of interesting because um, on one hand we think, well, he's God. What languages does Jesus know? All of them. New Swahili, Mandarin, got it all. Even English, no problem. But the, the rea reality would be he would have grown up speaking Aramaic, of course, and so that would be his first tongue. The, his lingua, the lingua franca would be Aramaic, what he grew, knew at home. And then in the synagogue, he would have learned Hebrew, and he would have known, been familiar with Hebrew. How much is kind of an open question, but enough. And probably, very likely, just living where he was living in Nazareth and in that part of Judea or Galilee, he would have come into contact with Greek as well because Greek was the language of commerce. And probably, simply for the fact that you had Romans running around all the place, he probably knew some Latin also. Some, you know, enough to get by. And these are the ones he would have learned. So these would be the languages Jesus would be familiar with. What's also interesting, and Stein doesn't say anything about this, but I think it's intriguing to think about, we know that Jesus grows up in Nazareth, but then he begins his ministry, and what becomes the home seat of his operations? Yeah, Capernaum. And what's kind of intriguing, it shows up frequently in the Gospel of Mark, where it talks about when they were in the house. Well, whose house were they in in Capernaum? Probably Jesus' house, which throws us. We, think, we don't ever think about Jesus owning anything, but he was a carpenter, and he would have lived in Nazareth in his house. Yeah, I mean, the house that Joseph would have lived in, but Jesus would have lived there. So when he moved to Capernaum, he probably moved probably the family, too. Maybe took Mary with him, maybe not. Mary shows up later, so maybe not. We don't know for sure, you know, if they came along with him. But he probably had a house in Capernaum. So when it talks about the house, it's probably his house. We don't know that definitively, but it's kind of interesting to think about. Because we are told later about when he was at the house of Peter, and that's when he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then we talk about other times about the house. So the house that had its roof ripped open so they could lower the guy down, that was probably Jesus' house. Kind of, kind of interesting. Now, whether he owned it or rented it, we don't know. But um, anyway. All right. Anything else there on um, chapter 5?
I yep. thought it was interesting that, that he noted uh, Justin Martyr thought that <laughs> perhaps Christ was a maker of plows and, and yokes and that kind of woodwork. It seems so different than the old descriptions that we always grew up with. You know. What did you grow up with? Well, car- carpet cabinet maker. Oh, maker cabinet maker. Schools, you know, oh, okay. Uh, they, they always, when Jesus is pictured, he's, he's working on something. I think I'm usually using the back of the building a cross, usually. That's the artwork I see. Yeah. 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 And holding yeah. three nails, it's yeah. always yeah. so yeah. poignant. Yeah. Uh, no. Is, is he does that last temptation in Nazareth uh, where he Post gets three water water to water to water. Water. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yes. That's also awesome part of it. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Well, and on that, you know, so. <laughs> with the carpentry image, I always think of, um, I can't remember. Oh, the Passion of the Christ, mm-hmm. with the scene where he creates the table and chairs and just kind of laughing about the concept that Jesus would have been the person who yeah. invented our common... Invented the table. Yeah, oh. <laughs> the table and the chairs, as we sit now. Like, yeah. Yeah. They show him making that, and I kind of just chuckle to myself. But uh, it, it's something to think about, what exactly yeah. would he have been working on. Yeah, right, so, right, it is. Um, Carpenter is kind of a vague term, remember. And so it can mean not just woodwork, but even stonemason, you know, mm-hmm. kind of just builder, okay. kind of a craftsman. So now the other thing we do get from this, and Stein points this out, was there's the idea of this kind of a effeminate, wimpy Jesus just doesn't wash. I mean, yeah. he would have been a, a carpenter, he would have been a craftsman, so he would have had, a, you know, he would have been in shape, basically, you know, had some muscles from doing what he had to do. Okay? Another thing with the humanity of Jesus, uh, was the average height back then about 4 foot 11? It was shorter. Why? I've I, 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 I just heard about every programming. I, I, one, I like to watch uh, a family guy, and they were making fun of the fact that Jesus uh, probably would have been shorter. And I was like, that, that would be almost as surprising as... Uh, Jesus returns, shows him coming back, and he's a foot uh, shorter than everybody else, and mm. he's explaining uh, uh, we were a lot shorter back then. <laughs> mm. yeah. I, I miss out on all that popular culture. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, good. Chapter 6, the baptism of Jesus. Um, the first thing I found really intriguing in this chapter was the point that Stein makes on page 91, just based on st- stats and demographics, that the Jews were all over the place in the ancient world that there were um, 8 million of them, 7% of the whole population, so that means every 1 in 14 people you met was a Jew. A lot of, a lot of Jews running around at that point, so they were a significant force in the empire. It's kind of intriguing thought there. Now, then he gets into the whole question about John the Baptist and um, the baptism of Jesus. And Stein handles this by saying, the baptism of Jesus is significant, and I agree with him. But what's the point? And I think Stein takes us a ways on this, but he doesn't go far enough. We want to go, I want to go even further with this. So, what's the point of the baptism? How are we to understand this? Yep. Doesn't Stein say it's switching from his normal, everyday carpenter life, switching from that to his, his time for my ministry now? All right. No doubt. The baptism absolutely marks the transition. He is going from being just simply a carpenter living in Nazareth, and what we're going to learn later to call the time of his active obedience simply doing what God has given him to do, being a faithful creature before his father, his active obedience, and then he's going to start turning into his active ministry, and it's going to eventually lead to the passive obedience of the passion itself. But this is the part where he's just being kind of a normal guy, fulfilling and keeping the law. Then with the baptism, everything shifts, and he's never the same guy again. And essentially, we can say he never goes back to the carpenter shop because he goes from the river into the wilderness, comes out of the wilderness, and he starts his public proclamation. And that's it. Everything's changed. This is, the mark, this is the defining moment. Now, that's good, but it's not enough because it's even more. Now, John's baptism was a baptism for the repentance of sin. So why does Jesus get baptized? He's supposed to be sinless. All right. He, well, John asked the same question. So it must be a good question because Jesus comes and presents himself, and John says, um, we've got the roles reversed. I should be baptized by you, not you by me. So John's got the same question. Why am I getting baptized? Why am I baptizing you? You're the sinless Messiah, the Son of God. It should be the way around. And Jesus' response is quite helpful. That he says, let it be so now so that all my righteousness might be fulfilled. And I think that just answers it right there. Jesus' whole point in his ministry, including his 30 silent years, the whole point is being actively obedient to the Father's will. 
He does what the Father wants done. So, any good Jew living in the time of Christ, in the time of John the Baptist's ministry, what was the Father's will for them to do? Go out and get baptized by John. This is what you did. You showed your, you were repentant, you were looking for the coming Messiah, and this is what you should do. So when Jesus is doing what you should do to be faithful to the Father, he does what everyone else should do. You go to John, and you get baptized. But the meaning is completely different, because he doesn't have sins to be forgiven. He's doing it to complete what he's been sent to do. He's being faithful in every regard, even to the point of being humble and being baptized. He doesn't need to be forgiven, but he needs to fulfill all righteousness. So that's why he's doing it. And I think that takes care of it rather nicely. Same thing with any kind of anything else in his life. Did, would he have paid the temple tax? We're told he did. Did he need to? Well, he's kind of like paying it to himself. Um, so, no, really he didn't need to, but he did for the sake of fulfilling righteousness. It's the same again and again and again. Same thing here with John. So I get baptized. That's what God wants. That's what I'll do. All right. Now, that takes care of it on one level. But now we go to a whole other level, which becomes really important. The very name Messiah which, of course, is nothing more than the English derivation of Mashiach, which means anointed one. And we have the same thing in Greek, Christos, meaning the one who's anointed. All right. So if you're going to be the Messiah, you've got to be anointed. Was David anointed? Yes. Samuel dumped the oil on his head. He's anointed. It counts. Was Aaron anointed? Yes. So David's anointed as king, Aaron is anointed as priest. Oil is dumped over him, and he's priest. So when does Jesus get anointed? In the river. This is the exact moment. Because what happens? He goes into the river, and it says that when he came up out of the water, oh, and by the way, this is another little one of those kind of things you need to be aware of. Is there anything in the Greek text that says that he was immersed? No. There's not. In fact, it just says that he came up out of the water. Now, if I go wading in the Jordan River, which is not much of a river, all right? We're talking one of those kind of knee-deep, maybe ankle-deep, some places, not much of a river. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. I haven't. I've seen the pictures, and like you. But it's not that much of a river. So if you go wading down into the river up to your ankles and then, or up to your knees and come up out of it, guess what? You've come up out of the river or up out of the water. So it's the same exact language you would use. So there's no requirement that he's immersed. And in fact, back to my Jesus of Nazareth movie, one of the things that's really cool about this movie is you've got John doing his ministry, and he's standing in about, oh, you know, ankle deep, knee deep water, and he's got people coming out into the river, and they kneel down in the water. He bends over and pours the water over their head, and he's baptizing them. And I'm thinking, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just kind of, Franco Zeffirelli just kind of heading it to the Baptist, and the Baptists are going, no, it's not right. But, um, so, Jesus gets baptized, and as soon as he's coming up out of the water, what happens? Three things. The heavens are ripped open, and then the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Now, does that mean a bird comes flapping down? Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe it's just that the Holy Spirit is being poured out on Jesus, just like a dove descending. Don't really know. And then the third thing, the divine voice. This is my son. This is the moment, guys. This is the anointing. This is when he is set aside for the task, and he is given the Spirit, and now he is anointed, he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, and now he is the one who is carrying sins. And Oshawa likes to say, this is the moment when he becomes the sin bearer. He starts carrying the sins. Now he goes into the mode of active messianic work, and nothing's ever the same again. And I think this is exactly the way to look at this. And it's really important to get this because Jesus is given the Spirit because from our pneumatology, Systems 3 stuff, next quarter, we have Jesus giving the Spirit so he is able to give the Spirit. This is critically important. He gets the Spirit. Now, don't get too hung up on this because you might say, oh, no, wait a minute. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he's fully God. So isn't the Spirit already there? So what's he getting in the Jordan? Well, we actually have this kind of idea of the Spirit coming multiple times in many ways. And so this is not a first appearance of the Spirit, but this is a special giving of the Spirit to Jesus for the sake of his messianic work. And so I think that's how we should understand the baptism. It's really difficult to um, overplay the significance of the baptism. It's huge. This is his anointing. This is his moment. This is the time. Now, we also have to be careful, and Stein's very good about this, even coming from an evangelical standpoint. He makes the case that Jesus' baptism is in no way normative for our baptisms. In other words, you don't say, Jesus is baptized, so so should we be. That's not the point. 
And there's never that argument made anywhere in Scripture because Jesus' baptism is totally singular and very different than you know, the baptism you and I go through. All right, so anything else in the baptism of Jesus? Yeah? Didn't, didn't he also refer to it as the beginning of the new covenant? Um, yeah, you can have, this is the inauguration, this is when it's starting. I mean, this is the, the Messiah's beginning his work, and the Messiah's bringing a new covenant. Sure, this is, this, is that, this is the time it's happening. And this is also where you've got, from this moment on, John just fades off and becomes insignificant because Jesus takes over. So that, that's it. And that's also why you have John is really an Old Testament prophet. He's the last Old Testament prophet, and then Jesus marks the beginning, the beginning of the new. In the, in the literal sense of Old yeah. Testament. Yeah, right, right. My concern with this is, um, how do we avoid going too far down, like the adoptionist position? We'll deal with that at, at length later on. Okay. And this is, yeah, we're not saying that he becomes God. He's fully God. But yeah. the anointing is this kind of, the special giving. And now, and here, this is also something, I didn't mention this, but I should kind of elaborate on this. This is not insignificant for Jesus himself. Because we have a tendency to think the baptism is really important for the people who are watching. It's really important for John the Baptist. It's really important for us in retrospect. But it's important for Christ, according to his human nature. Because that would have been significant. You're a, you know, a man, fully human, and fully God, but you're fully human. And so to have the you know, skies break open and this voice say, this is my son, it's got to be like, yeah, this is all right. I mean, it's certainly encouraging for Jesus himself as a man. And don't diminish that. He's a real man. And the encouragement is appropriate. So this, this is significant for him. And that would have, even I believe, part of what sustained him through the, through the temptation and through these, these, what's ahead. Yeah, John. Clola made the point in Synoptics that it's only for Christ because <clears throat> it probably wasn't a public proclamation. Yeah. You know, we have this vision of the people looking up and wondering. Yeah, whoa, what's so that It probably about? wasn't right. obvious to anyone but Christ. Right, exactly. And so, you know, whether it's got a wider audience or not, the real point is it certainly is intended for Christ himself. That's why this anointing idea is really significant. Yeah. If, if Christ was the only one to hear it, though, how do we know it was said? Because the Holy Spirit whispered it to Matthew. Okay. <laughs> no, this is... The, the, okay. Now, see, now you're going the other way. Um, Stein asked these questions, and, you know, that Jesus would have, you know, been two and a half, three years of ministry with his disciples. Would he have talked about some of these things? Probably. And so, you know, go back and, hey, remember when I was baptized? Let's talk about that. Here's what happened. You know, that's not far-fetched at all. It could easily have been part of the teaching of Jesus to his disciples. All right, good? Chapter 7, the temptation. All right, the temptation. This is an interesting section because we have the, um, the whole question about what's really going on here. Now, in the first thing, we have Matthew and Luke with two different accounts. This should not bother us in the least. And this is just an example of the gospel writers rearrange things the way they want to, and they don't worry about it um, like we do. We worry about, oh, you changed the chronology, that's not true. And they didn't understand true that way at all. If you're telling the stories, you can rearrange them as it works your, how, how it works best, not a big deal. So don't get too worried, worked up about that. So that's the first thing. Now, the much bigger issue here, though, the real question is, were these real temptations or not? And what's behind the question then is, could Jesus have sinned? Could Jesus sin? And that's sort of the driving question. Now, you know where Stein comes down. Stein ends up saying, yes, the real, real temptations. That's how scripture treats it. But there's the other side of this whole question. And it's just a basic syllogism. And Pieper lays it out for us pretty clearly. Pieper's got a strong opinion on this as well. So we have the first point is, God can't sin. By definition, God can't sin. And then we have the second statement, which is, Jesus is God. And so then we have the conclusion, therefore, what's the conclusion? Jesus can't sin. And when you see it laid out as a, you know, as a basic syllogism in three parts, with the, you know, the, the first two points of the proposition, then the, the therefore, the resolved, yeah, it's pretty clear cut. Jesus can't sin. And on the one side, we say, yep, that's true. But on the other side, we say, were the temptations for Jesus, fully God, fully human, very real? Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, because we say Jesus is fully man also, man can sin, Jesus is man, Jesus can You can sin. go that route. But I mean, see, I, <coughs> I know. That's yeah, why yeah. that... Uh, yeah, matter. that's why it gets difficult. And that's why we have to say, ultimately it's true, Jesus is not capable of sin because he's fully, fully God, fully divine. And yet, because he's fully human, he undergoes temptation and it's a very real temptation. Now, 
Part of the problem we have is we have this text in Hebrews where it says we don't have a high priest who is not sympathetic, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. And this is the, the author of Hebrews makes this argument. So we want to say, well, you see, there had to be real temptation. But we have to be careful here because I would argue that from the very beginning, Jesus' temptation is unlike the kind of temptations you and I face, simply for the fact that he is sinless. And you and I aren't. When you and I are faced with a temptation, we don't know what it's like to be tempted from the point of sinlessness. Because when we get faced with a temptation, we're already up to our eyeballs and contemplating it, thinking about it, wondering about it, and, you know, kind of mulling it around. And how many times have we already committed the sin in our mind before we finally say, no, I can't do that. Boy, I stood firm on that temptation. You know? And see, we just, we just, we don't handle these things the same way. Jesus is sinless. And so when the temptation comes to him, it's going to be different. And this should not get us all worked up. The fact is, he's fully human like we are, but in many ways, he's not like us. And that's okay. And see, even that verse from Hebrews, when it says he was tempted in every way as we are, well, okay, the point is he's really a human being, and he goes through what we go through, but it doesn't mean that every possible temptation you could think of, Jesus faced. It can't mean that. Because did Jesus face the temptation of being unfaithful to his spouse? No, he didn't have one. And, you know, did he, so, you know, there's all kinds of things we could think of that he didn't face that temptation. Did he face the temptation to steal when he was, you know, a soldier? No, he didn't face that temptation. You know, so there was just countless things we could think of that he didn't face that temptation. And so the point is that he was completely human, went through and experienced what human beings experience when they're living in this world, but it doesn't mean he has to have gone through every single experience you and I go through or it's not legit. That's not the point. He's fully God, fully human, and yet living without sin. So the temptations come, and they're very real, and they're very pointed, and they're very much um, effective, and yet they have no impact on Jesus because he's resisting, as he should, being an obedient son. So that's, I think, the way to kind of skin this thing. So the question of could he or couldn't he have sinned, yeah. Um, the point is, well, in one standpoint, no. In another standpoint, well, he's human. Theoretically, I suppose, but really, no. And so you just kind of go around and around. The, the bigger point for us is to realize that faced with this onslaught from Satan, Jesus is faithful. That's the real point for us.